it just reminds me of when we were in uni and um, we were believing God for a bus to move us from place to place from in our fellowship then and we eventually got it and we called it Philip because we thought he was an evangelist and it, it did help us quite a bit in those days even though it gave us a lot of trouble along the way but it did its job so there's nothing wrong with naming your car I think it's it's brilliant it does its job so um, how many of us were here last week when we went out into the streets of Tinmouth after service for Super Sunday. Does anyone have anything they would like to share based on that? Any testimonies, any experiences that they feel might be worth um, sharing with everybody else? You may or you may not. It's just a, a thought. Okay. Oh, is Anna sharing something? The, um, the essence of all that is basically we're, we're in this season of trying to um, encourage people to reach out to people. And that was just one of the opportunities that we thought we could try out. And um, what we do need to be aware of, we're not just introducing people to a lifestyle or a religion or a way of doing things. We're actually introducing them to a person. And that person is Jesus. And it's something that we do need to be very conscious about. Let's quickly turn our Bibles to Philippians 3. Now, let me give you a warning ahead of time. I am going to be asking you to open a lot of scriptures today. So please bear with me. Um, hopefully we'll find all of them. Um, Philippians 3. And then on, in our connect groups this week, we'll probably spend a bit more time looking at those scriptures as well. Philippians 3, this is um, Paul speaking, starting from verse 1. Um, whatever happens, this is the New Living Translation. It's not my usual translation, but it, it is a nice translation. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship this by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Verse 5, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there were, ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded stricter, strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death so that one way or the another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. This was Paul, someone who wrote the vast majority of um, the New Testament saying that he wanted to know Christ. And it's a challenge to me, and I, I think it should be a challenge to us as well, not to rest on our laurels and think, I think I know enough of God to live a life uh, that God wants me to live. Paul said, I want to know him. So as far as he was concerned, the more he knew him, the more he wanted to know him. And it's a challenge for us to continue to try to know him, to continue to try and create opportunities to experience him. Because the more we know him, the more we'll experience him. And the more we experience him, the more we feel we want to know him. And it just goes on and on and on. Now, one of the easiest ways by which you can know a person is by paying attention to the things they say. 
you know, if you look at each and every one of us, I'm sure for those of us that have known each other for more than a year or two, you only need to hear what is said to know who said it. In a small community like this, it's, it's, um, it's very funny because I don't need to know what somebody has, uh, what, who said what. All I need to know is what was said, and I can tell you this person said it, simply because that's what comes out of that person's mouth over and over again. Scriptures tell us in Luke chapter 6, maybe we won't read that now, but it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, uh, it's, this is just a tip. The best way to know whether someone is full of bitterness is to listen to what they say. The best way to know whether someone is full of love is to listen to what they say. And the best way to know whether someone is full of complaining and anger is to listen to what they say. Now, some of us are good at saying one thing and meaning something else, but the vast majority of us do that, do the, what we say. Same thing with Christ. That one of the easiest ways of coming to know Jesus is to listen to what he says. Um, the best source of the, what Jesus has said over the years are in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I think over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about different parts of the Gospels, reading about Jesus being on the streets, and talking about those areas. I would like us to focus on a small area of the Gospels today, which is the period between when Jesus rose from the dead and when he ascended into heaven. Why did I choose those parts? Well, because I think they're the parts of scriptures that the disciples were least likely to forget. Because there's just this thing about the last words that someone spoke, or the last words you speak to someone. You, you seem to give those words a bit more credence than to everything else they've spoken to. In doing that, we also need to be open to this, the fact that the scripture, the gospels were written by four different people. Careful. Written by four different people. And what you'd find out is, at times you find out that there are differences in what one person says. For example, um, Matthew said that uh, when Mary Magdalene went to the, the tomb, there was an earthquake and then the stone was rolled away. However, if you looked at uh, the other uh, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't mention that there was an earthquake. All they said was the stone was rolled away. Um, they all agreed that Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the empty tomb. Matthew and Mark said there was one angel at the tomb when, they went, when um, she went there, while Luke and John mentioned two angels. So it, it, somebody might argue that it just shows that these things are not accurate. I actually find it quite interesting because it's just the way we see things. We all look at the same situation, the same person, and see different angles, and see different perspectives. And it's all about perspectives for these guys. It's, it's like that story of the four blind men who were told to feel an, elef an elephant and to describe an elephant based on what they felt. Somebody felt, oh, this animal is big and strong. Somebody said, wow, this animal is sharp. Someone touched the tail and said, this animal is small and wiggly, you know? You, you get different perceptions of the same event. And at times, that is how it is with Christ and with God. We all have had different experiences with what, we, what Jesus has done for us. For some of us, we've seen God heal us physically. For some of us, we've seen God heal us emotionally. Some have seen God provide. Some have seen God protect. You know, and it is, it is very rare for one person to say, I have seen God do all these things. There will always be one thing or the other that we said, I actually haven't seen God do that in my life yet. That is the, one of the importances of community. The fact that you can encourage somebody to say, look, I've seen God heal me. So he's actually in the business of healing people. Just as he has, I've seen God provide for me, so I know he can provide for you as well. So that's the beauty of looking at... Um, the, the scriptures based on what four people have said about the same events. So like I said, we're focusing on the, uh, the, that short time. Luke 24, let's have a quick look at Luke 24. And we're going to be spending a bit of time there in Luke chapter 24, um, verse 45. 
let me put this in. It's just one verse, and it is quite, I find it quite profound. It says, Jesus, he was talking about Jesus. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It, it, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It lets me realize that actually it's God that gives us understanding of scriptures. You know, you can sit down and read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and have no understanding of what the scriptures mean unless God himself explains it to you. And this is what Jesus is saying here. He had spent time with his disciples. He had spent time with them three years and he had taught and taught and taught. But it looked as if it was at this point that he actually opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Same thing. We do have to place ourselves in that position where we look at the Bible and see it more than just stories. It, it, it is quite um, disappointing at times that um, when, when I was in school growing up, if I read the stories in the Bible in school, because it was taught in school, I accepted it as being true. Because of, after all, the schools don't lie, right? They, they, they teach you the truth, and whatever they teach in school is correct and is true. But as the years have gone on, we realize that actually that isn't always the case. And these um, stories in the Bible, as we call them, which my growing up was taught to me as these things happened, in a sense, it's almost been taught as these are Bible stories. And they are no longer being taught as these things happened. You know, it's just something that uh, <laughs> I think about at times. Anyway, back to Luke. Luke chapter 24 is where we were. And one of the statements, we're just going to look at a few of the statements Jesus made to his disciples. This is just, this is not meant to be an extensive look at what he said, but it's meant to be a challenge to us to spend time in these scriptures, allowing God himself to open them up to us, to actually see. To actually see and to hear what he's speaking to us. I want to reemphasize this, the fact that we can all look at the same scriptures and get something different from it. The guys in my connect group can testify to this. We come in and say, this is what we're going to talk about. And somebody brings out something else and we're like, um, well, we didn't prepare for that. But it's the same scriptures. Okay, Luke 24, verse 36 to 39. The background to this, you know, these two disciples that were coming from Emmaus and they had spent time with Jesus and um, uh, they had walked on the road and they had, they had been talking to Jesus for a while. 36, and just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. He said exact something similar in John 20 where he also said, peace be with you. Now, why would somebody tell you peace be with you? Because in, in, in Jesus' eye, he already knew that there was a turmoil going through the minds of these people. You only need to read the scriptures to know that these guys were in a state of chaos. First, we're waiting for a Messiah. Jesus came. He did all his wonderful miracles. Then he died. And you are in that state of, what does all this mean? And then, let me throw this out. What would you guys say if suddenly Dave Longman came out from there? He's not there, I can tell you that. But what would you say if he just suddenly came out from there? There are probably a, a few of us that will probably be out there before he gets to the front of the stage. Because it's not normal. It's not natural. First of all, he's dead. 
Sep no, not not not. <laughs> No, not Dave Longman. We're talking about Jesus here. First of all, Jesus had died. They had seen him buried. You know. Second of all, the door was locked. And this guy just walked in. They didn't hear the door open, the door was locked, nothing. He just appeared. So you can just imagine what was going through their minds. But Jesus re replied to them and said, peace be with you. The other story that was mentioned was in John 20, where um, part of it had to do with, uh, what was his name, Thomas as well, who didn't believe what was going on. And Jesus came and said, peace be with you. I decided to do a bit of Greek and Hebrew checking to see what is because I thought oh, peace means shalom as in that's what we've always known peace to mean but actually in the Greek here it meant something different it, it was described as a word called Irene and it translates to mean quietness rest safety, security, prosperity it's an assurance in Christ in who we are and what he has performed already he came into their situations to tell them, look, peace be with you. There is security, there is safety, there is uh, prosperity in that situation. So even if you find yourself in a situation where you think it can't get any worse, Jesus comes in and says the same thing. Peace be with you. Now, one thing that we do in church is we tend to sit next to people that we, are, we know and we are comfortable with. So we tend to know the different challenges that times are facing, hopefully. Um, can you look at the person next to you and just tell that person, God's peace be with you? Can we? No, 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 no. no. It's not just... You know, you look at that person and tell that person, you know what they're going through. For example, I'm assuming, the assumptions can be wrong. I'm assuming, for example, that Dave and Adi know what's going on between Dave and Adi. So Dave can tell Adi, peace be with you, knowing what she's going through. And Adi can tell Dave, peace be with you, knowing what he's going through. So can you look at that person again and just tell the meaning from the bottom of your heart, God's peace be with you. And it, 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 it does, it is a challenge to be able to consciously walk in the peace of God. The Bible describes it as the peace that goes beyond understanding. The peace that is not of this world is what Jesus is saying. Peace be with you. The second set of statements which... I'm sure we, a lot of us can quote without actually opening the Bible is in Matthew 28, what we call the Great Commission. Can we quickly turn to that, please? Matthew 28. And with one hand there, we can also look at Mark 16. Those are the two scriptures that talk about the commission that God has given to us. Matthew 28. From verse 18, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you quickly then move to Mark 16, what Mark says was something very similar. He said in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. 
Now, we do spend a lot of time, and we have spent a lot of time talking about going to all the world and make disciples. But the first thing Jesus said before he even said going to all the world is, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I think that's a lot of authority. So you, the, the next question you then ask is, what is authority? I went back to the Greek again, or the, yeah, the Greek, and it's exousia. It was a word I was more familiar with. And it suggested two things. There was the authority part of it, and there was the power part of it. The authority being influence, and the power being ability. Let me try and break it down. Um, if you walk down the streets of Tinmouth and you see a police officer dressed, it's not a matter of how tall or short the person is, whether it's a man or a woman, just that uniform gives them the authority. So you would have, I've seen it happen before, where you see a petite lady speaking to someone as big as Paul, for example, and telling him to stand down. And she can stand there and do it because she's walking in that authority of that position of being a police officer. That person has influence. It's not a matter of whether you are strong or not, but you have influence. It's just like if you go to work, for those of us that still work, and you have an employer. It's not a matter of whether the employer actually knows what they are doing or not. They pay your salaries. So if they tell you do this, you do it. That is influence. That is authority. On the other side, you actually have the ability side of things, where you are talking about, okay, if you saw a boxer, maybe like Anthony Joshua, for example, standing in front of you and telling me and says, sit down. You probably will sit down just because you think, I don't want him to hit me. You know, that is the power side of things. Jesus here is saying he has been given all influence and all ability in heaven and on earth. That's great, I think. But he didn't just stop there. It is based on the fact that he has this authority and this power that he says, therefore, go. We, we get anxious. I, I get anxious as well. When you tell me to go and preach to someone, I, I feel more comfortable here because these are people that I know. You know, but if you tell me to go and preach to someone else on the streets, I get anxious because I know it's not my area of, in quote, strength. But if I remind myself, I'm actually not going in my own power. I'm going in the authority of Jesus. It makes a difference. Now, in Mark, it then tells you what that authority actually holds. It says, you will cast out demons in my name. You will speak in new languages. You will be able to handle snakes with safety. I will not encourage you to do it, but he's saying you can. If you look at Paul, when he was in the Bible, there was actually an event in which he was beaten by a snake, and he just took the snake and shoved it away. That is actually a physical manifestation of what this scripture was saying. You'll be able to handle snakes with safety. If they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. I've heard someone, I, I won't say it. <laughs> um, no, I, I will say it. I've heard someone say that that gives you enough uh, reason to drink coffee because you know you drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt you. That's someone's interpretation. I drink coffee. Let me start from there. So, but basically, he's saying you drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. You know, I, so I asked myself the question, how many times have I cast out a demon? How many times have I laid my hands on the sick and they've recovered? How many times have I had gastroenteritis? Where I've eaten something, I know actually this is food poison and I'm running to the toilet to and fro. You know, scripture here tells us he has been given all authority, and that authority has been given to us to go out and do 
what he has called to, he has called us to do. I think that's quite a challenge to us, to me as a person, you know, and to realize that I am missing out on this authority if I don't do what God has asked me to do. You can say, well, it's just me. But no, it's not just me. Because my family is missing out if I don't go in the authority that God has given me. My friends are missing out if I don't go in what God has called me to do. The people on the streets are missing out. My colleagues at work are missing out. And that is a challenge. But we do have to go back to the starting point where it says, I have given you, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Okay. John chapter uh, 21. Like I said, we're going to be doing a lot of moving from scriptures to scriptures. John chapter 21. Now, this was the one, I think this was one of my favorites in some of the things he said. All the Matthew, Mark, and Luke all dedicated one chapter to the life after he rose from the dead. John dedicated two. Because if you looked at the nature of John, John looked like that person that would probably use two or three words to say something that could be said in one. He was the, in quotes, the emotional one. The Bible describes him as the one that places his head on Jesus' chest. He was the one that was into relationships, into the fact that for God so loved the world, which was only written by John. So that was the kind of person John was. Now, this is John talking to Peter with John, uh, sorry, Jesus talking to Peter with John hanging around somewhere. And um, verse 20 says, Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. That was John himself. The one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and had asked the Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? I love his response. Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. And he went on and said, so the rumor spread among the community that this disciple wouldn't die. You know, I find that amazing because we, we tend to have this, we, we have this tendency to compare how well we're doing based on how everybody else around us is doing. You know, I, I, I'll look at, you know, somebody else and say, well, I'm doing better than that person, so I'm doing well enough. You know, I'm a good person. I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't kill. I'm good. But this was a challenge that God was giving to Peter, that your business is not with what I have called John to do. Your business is with what I have called you to do. <laughs> you know, we, uh, being a small church, we, we tend to have a station where a few people do a lot of things. And we, at times, get to that stage where we grumble when we do what we are doing. We say, well, I'm the only person doing it. You know, or why isn't that person taking part? Jesus is saying to Peter, what is your business with what that person is or is not doing? You are the one that have to give account for what you've been called to do. Now, let me say this and put this in perspective. It doesn't mean that in a church setting, you should isolate yourself from everybody else. Everybody has a role to play. The question is, what is your role in the church? And when I talk about the church, yes, you could say Mars Hill as a small part of the church, but I'm talking about the global church as well. What is your role? It's not your business what somebody else has been called to do. Forget about them in that sense. Are you doing what God has called you to do? And, 
you know, it, it brings to mind the story about the, the workers who came to work and the, the person employing them said, okay, you start at 12, you get this amount of money. You start at three, you get the same amount of money. You start at six, you get the same amount of money. And then at nine o'clock, you finished and the guy that came in the morning is angry because I've worked 12 hours. This guy has worked three hours and you are paying us the same amount of money. Why is that fair? It's not about being fair. It's about being, what have you been asked to do? You would have thought that, you know, Jesus would have been, you know, sentimental. You know, this, these are very emotionally charged periods. These people have gone through a lot and they're now spending the last time they're going to spend with Jesus. That he would be chilled with them and he would be, you know, all sloppy and sentimental. No. Jesus just told you to her, what is that to you? Face what you've been called to do. And to be frank, if you go through scriptures, if you read what Jesus has said about different situations, you find out that Jesus was not actually a sloppy person. He, was, he would tell you how it was. Yes, he was emotional at times. There were times when he said Jesus wept when he went to, uh, to raise Lazarus from the dead. You know, people would come and say Jesus was filled with compassion to this person. But Jesus never hid from saying the truth. And people tend to say, well, be like Jesus. If we were to be like Jesus in this world and told somebody you are a whitewashed sepulchre, it probably won't go down well. You know? Anyway, so that's what, what I'm just trying to bring out. The fact that Jesus challenged Peter and said, focus on what you've been asked to do. Don't worry about what I've called John to do. John 20, the same John 20, 24 to 29, it says one of the 12 disciples named Thomas was not with the others when Jesus came and they told him we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days after disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked but suddenly as before Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. You know, and... Um, the blessing that God is talking about here is, is not that there was, you know, it's in believing in the absence of any physical evidence to tell you that it's there. For example, like the, the, story, uh, the testimony that Bella was sharing, what evidence was there that there was a car on the way? There was none. But you still go ahead and you pray. A lot of us, uh, you know, we have, not a lot of us, all of us have senses, you know. We can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can taste to different degrees, I have to say. You know, and we tend to judge how real something is based on all these senses. You know, if we feel physically unwell, the normal response is, I'm not feeling very well, I'm sick, or I'm ill, or whatever. What Jesus is challenging Thomas to do and is challenging us as well is to go beyond, is to see beyond what we see. Is to believe beyond what we can describe. Faith in, in Hebrews 11 says is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By this, the elders obtained a good report. You know, in essence, what if you looked at this John 20, basically what happened was Thomas said, I will not believe unless I see. It was a choice. He made a choice that unless I actually see Jesus and I see those holes, I would not believe it. Why would he make that? These are his friends. These are the people they've gone through thick and thin with. They've suffered together. They've seen him do wonderful miracles. 
And just because he wasn't there when Jesus came the first time, he made a decision, I will not believe unless I see. And Jesus was correcting him and saying, actually, the person that believes without seeing is the person that is blessed. Let me give a practical illustration. I'm not picking on anyone here. But a lot of us have had illnesses at one point in time in our lives or the other. And subconsciously, we can be saying to ourselves and to God that I would not believe that God has healed me unless I see the physical manifestation of that healing. Jesus is saying that is not the way it is. Believe because I said so, not because you have seen it. Does that make sense? Yeah. We've talked about the car that Bella has talked about, which is a very, very good illustration and it ties in very nicely with what we're saying here. You know, it could be with financial situations. You need to pay for something. You need to have a bill to pay. And you decide, you know what, I'm not going to believe that God has met my need until I see the money in my account. The money doesn't have to be in your account for God to meet your need. It's a challenge. But actually, it's a challenge that we have as Christians to believe without seeing. It is, um, how do I put it? <laughs> faith, it, it, when you are in faith, it doesn't mean that you don't have doubt. You know, and at times people think, if I doubt something, then I'm not in faith. No. When you are in faith, at times you still have things that will challenge your faith and what you believe. But the act of faith is what you do when you are doubting. Scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. That is in Romans 10. The only way you can build your faith is by hearing what God has said. So even if you come out and we pray for you and you go the whole week and you don't hear what God has said about your health, the chances are you come back here next week again and we'll pray for you. And we will always pray for you simply because scriptures have told us to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We will always pray for you. But a time comes when you have to ask yourself, what is God saying about my situation? And how much time am I spending to hear what God has said about my situation before faith is built up? Faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God. And this is a challenge I want to throw out to everybody. We all know the different circumstances we are in and the things that we, we think we are believing God for. My question to you is, what has God told you about that situation? What have you heard? How much time have you spent hearing what God has said about that situation? That's a challenge I will leave with you, please. I'll run through there. Two other um, statements Jesus made. One is in John 20, that same John 20, in verse 22, it says, receive the Holy Spirit. And in Luke, it talks about, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit has come. You know, they, these guys were waiting, but we don't have to wait anymore. He is here. How do I know? Because Acts tells me that you know, they came up upon them like the sound of a rushing mighty wind with tongues of fire on their heads and they all went out and spoke with tongues and they preached the gospel and 3,000, was it 5,000 people got saved in a go. This links in quite nicely to that first thing we talked about, about the authority in which we are going out in. The Holy Spirit in us actually is able to do a lot more than we think we can do. The Holy Spirit has the knowledge and has the power. You have no business going out without the Holy Spirit. But thank God he's here with us. And we do need to be aware of it. The Holy Spirit is here with us. Jesus told these guys, don't go out until the Holy Spirit comes. 
But when he did, they didn't stop going. They didn't stop. They walked in different ways. Not all of them went into the streets, as you can imagine. But they didn't stop manifesting what God had called them to do. And then finally, John 21. Just continuing from what we were reading earlier. And it says uh, in verse 15, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus told him. He repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. You know, I'd always wondered, why did Jesus ask him the question three times? The same question. You know, and someone preached to me once and said, the reason he said it three times was because he had denied Jesus three times. Maybe. Maybe not. I, 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 have, no <laughs> I have no answer to that. But one thing I do know was, Jesus knew that Peter loved him. He knew. Why? Because Jesus is Jesus, right? He knew that, Peter, that, that Jesus loved him. But the challenge was for Peter himself to realize that he actually loved Jesus. He had to be reminded that, you know, it's not just about the head knowledge. And I'm sure if I ask everybody here, how many of you love Jesus? We will all raise our hands. Some faster than others, I agree. But we would all raise our hands. But the question really wasn't, do you love me? It was, what do you do with that love? Feed my lambs. You know? In 18, it says, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And then he says, at the end, follow me. And the question I would throw out to everybody here today is, do you love Jesus? Well, I guess nobody does that. You know, if you love him, follow him. In, in, um, in Nigerian setup and culture, if you call somebody's name three times, the person knows he's in big trouble. You know, if like if I say Anne, you say yes, Anne, yes, Anne, ah, there's trouble, you know. And Jesus asked Peter that same thing. Do you love me? He asked him three times. So for me, it's something that has gravity, the fact that he was asking him three times. But the issue really is, if you love me, you will feed my lambs. That was what Jesus told Peter. And that was his call. And it was following that that he then asked that question about what about John? And Jesus said, don't worry about John. You follow me. Do you love Jesus? What has he asked you to do? do it. He's not asking you to do it in your strength, in your ability, in your wisdom, because that's very variable. He's asking you to do it in his strength, in his authority, which is all the authority in heaven and on earth. And he said there as well, I will be with you till the end of the age. So, he's with me now. When I come out of here and do whatever it is I have to do on Sunday afternoon, he's with me then. 20, 30 years time, if he hasn't come, he's still with me. And he's still asking me the exact same question. Do you love me? Will you feed my sheep? You are going out in my authority and in my power. So basically that's all I have to say this morning. So let's just spend some time. Let's close our eyes and just think about this and, you know, and just ask ourselves the questions and just challenge ourselves because that's what I like to do. I like to challenge people, you know. And let's just commit ourselves to God again and answer the question that Jesus asked Peter 
do you love me? While the band comes up and they lead us in worship, you know, ask yourself that question and answer that question for yourself. You know, one of the things we're going to do is to take communion to serve just as a physical reminder of what Jesus has done for us and to help us kind of put, should I say, a physical thing to something that is much deeper than just being physical. Answering that question, do you love Jesus? Do what he has asked you to do. Doing it in his strength.